Welcome to another UAS weekly news update video. And this week, I want to talk about five different things. I want to talk about first a group in the UK that requested some information about drone incidents. And then a little update on night flying from the FA. There was an article recently that may be hinting at uh, some coming changes. And then I want to talk about the ULC tort law. We've had a whole entire video with Sarah uh, last week about the tort law, and there's just some updates, so we'll talk about that. And then I want to talk about the waivers to fly over people. Now, two weeks ago, I mentioned that, and uh, there's been more waivers, more approval, and then some, uh, some news also from the, uh, the, comp the company that makes the parachute. And then I want to talk the, the partnership between Raytheon and Airmap in regards to UTM. So let's get to this. Let's get to the first one, which is the UK group that requests a Freedom of Information Act. Now, there's been about 350 incidents in the UK airspace that were reported that were related to drones. Now, a, a group called Airprox Reality Check filed a Freedom of Information request to determine if there was actually evidence or to find what the evidence was that drones were involved in such incidents. And basically what came out, and this is a quote, is no confirmation that a drone has flown close to an aircraft other than the report by the pilot. And I find this very interesting because essentially what's happening is that we have a lot of drone reports. And again, lack of um, evidence doesn't mean that there is no drone there, just means that there is nothing to corroborate the fact that there was a drone there. So we have to be very careful and we have to be uh, extremely cautious when something is reported that there was a drone sighting at a certain altitude, at a certain location, and immediately we say, we blame the operator, we blame the drone community in general, and I think we're jumping to the conclusion a little too often. So in this case, there was actually zero proof that out of those 350 incidents that drones were involved, and that includes actually what happened in Gatwick. So um, if you remember back in December, around Christmas, drones were supposedly seen flying around the Gatwick airport, shutting down the, 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 the traffic, shutting down all the aircraft for extended period of time, creating chaos. And um, bottom line is there was never a picture of a drone. There was never any uh, real report evidence that a drone was there. Again, I'm not saying that there was no drone there, but what I'm saying is that there is no evidence that there was. So you, you make your decision on this, but be careful. When you share information, when you share these articles that talk about drone sightings, just think about what it's doing to our industry as well. Until we have proof, and again, drones are dangerous. They do not need to fly near manned aircraft and they can create accidents. Uh, they, we just, we just got to make sure that when we blame a drone and blame a drone operator, that we do have evidence that it actually happened. Now, with that being said, there's technology, and I've talked about this technology before in this video here. We talked about remote ID, and we talked about uh, the difference between remote ID and ADSB. Now, remote ID would help us, in this case, to gather meaningful data to actually find out what happened and prevent the mass hysteria that we see when these reports come out. Something else that happened in the news this week, there was an article that was posted in the FAA Safety Briefing magazine that is talking about night flying and the changes that the FAA is about to make to night flying, or proposing to make to night flying. Now, as you know, night flying currently at the moment for remote pilots requires a waiver, and this process can take a little while, and, um, and, and a lot of these requests, over 10,000 of them actually, a lot of them have been shut down because of the wording and because uh, people are not following the proper procedure to request those waivers. Now, this is nothing new. This is actually something that happened with the Reauthorization Act, and there was something in there that talks about the, uh, the process that people would have to go through in order to get night waivers. And that process would be two different things. One would be to receive training on uh, specifically night vision, night illusion, and night physiology, and also to be equipped with the anti-collision light that is visible from three nautical miles, which is something that we already see in the approval and the waiver and the requirements in the regulation under Part 107. Now, if you're part of my Part 107 course, then you are already familiar with a lot of these things, night vision, night delusion, night uh, physiology, all those are topics that I already cover in my course and that you should be familiar with. So I'm not sure yet how the FAA is gonna come up with this. Now, something interesting that is discussed in that article is that the FAA built this regulation uh, under Part 107 around the fact that um, it's technology neutral, which means that if the technology change, which we know in, in, in our world changes extremely fast, uh, they didn't want to create regulation that actually was going to be um, taken over by, by, by new technology 
uh, the next day. So they decided to make everything technology neutral, which is kind of where we are now, where they want to basically have some kind of night training and just have proper equipment on the airplane. Now, I'm not sure how this would show up if you would have a special uh, rating on your license. Uh, now, if you, if you look at the back of your license, if you're part 107, you already have a rating, which is a, an unmanned aircraft pilot rating. Um, so I'm not sure how this would, this would uh, uh, be categorized if you have a, a special document that you have to carry with you to prove that you are uh, okay to fly at night. Now, it's important to note that some countries, for example, have a special rating for flying at night. For example, in Europe, in some countries, you have to get a night rating before you can fly a manned aircraft. So I do like the fact that the FAA is going after this and making it a little bit easier to fly at night, something more of a routine flight rather than more of a, an advanced operation. The next piece that's interesting this week in the news is the fact that there was industry support for the new ULC tort law update. If you are not familiar with ULC and the tort law, I recommend that you go and visit this video right here. I'm going to put a link. Uh, we talked about it with Sarah. We went into great detail about what the ULC is, what tort law means, and then what the proposed changes, changes actually were. And what you'll see is that there's a group of industry leaders that includes Amazon, that includes the AMA, uh, AUVSI, DJI, Skydrone, uh, Skyward, and, uh, and a bunch of other companies that were actively opposed to the very early version of the ULC tort law proposal. And, um, and they basically had written letters that said that they do not support this law or this proposal and that it needs to be changed. And the, the main point of contention with all this was the fact that the first 200 feet from, from surface all the way to 200 feet was going to be well, they were trying to make it so that it belonged to the owner of the property. And, uh, and that would have basically made any kind of flight under 200 feet a major pain and, uh, and getting approval from the property owner and all this. So this group got together and uh, sat down with the ULC and came up with a new proposal. And that proposal is what the group is saying, hey, we're okay with this. Uh, you can go ahead and get it approved in Anchorage and that's gonna be later this year. So hopefully we see some reasonable tort law that comes out of this group. And again, if you want more information, go ahead and take a look at the video that I posted in the comments. Something else that happened this week is that we see more and more waivers to fly over people using a parachute approved under the ASTM standard design specifications. This is something that I talked about two weeks ago, and you can take a look at the video, um, where we had uh, the company for the first time, now this is not the first time that we get approval to fly over people, but it was the first time that we get approval to fly over people by meeting a standard. And ASTM is this organization that comes up with standards, and they had created a standard for parachutes that the FAA is happy with. So what happened is um, in the last two weeks since the last news update, we had uh, two more companies that were approved using that exact parachute, and the company that makes it is Pair Zero. And uh, Pair Zero has been doing the testing, and if they have approval, or I shouldn't say approval, they do meet the standard, the ASTM standard, for their parachute for the Phantom 4. Now this week, what they came up with is a, an approval for the Mavic uh, drone, the DJI Mavic. So that's another step forward. Now you should be able to with the proper paperwork. Now, this is not a, an automatic approval. You don't just slap the parachute on the drone and then you're good to go fly over people. You still have to go through uh, the, um, the process of risk management and all these things and make sure that you meet the requirements. But with that being said, this is a major step forward. Uh, we should be able to see more companies applying for these waivers and getting the waivers for now two different types of drones, which is, which is great news. The last piece of news that I want to talk about is Raytheon that is partnering with AirMap in a, an effort to help air traffic controllers utilize a drone management system. And now we've talked about this in the past, the UTM, the uh, Unmanned Traffic Management System. That's something that um, is kind of still a concept at this stage. But the idea is how do we get... Uh, manned aircraft and unmanned aircraft to work together in the airspace and how do we get proper separation between all these aircraft. Now air traffic controllers are the one in charge of the airspace for their block of airspace and uh, this effort right here with Raytheon and AirMap is basically trying to get the two groups together, the two manned traffic and unmanned traffic uh, to work together and, and provide separation for each other. It will be interesting to see where this goes 
I just hope that this effort right here leads into a, uh, a free service for manned and unmanned pilots. And um, I know there's been a lot of discussions about AirMap and, uh, and their business model in the past. So this is a chance for them to, uh, to prove to the rest of the community what they're all about. And, uh, and we'll see where this goes. And if it's in the news again, I'll keep you guys posted. For now, this is it. Um, as always, please go ahead and subscribe. If you have any questions, any comments about this video, please go ahead and, and uh, leave them in there. I reply to all the comments. I read all your comments. I appreciate all the enthusiasm that you've had for these videos. So I will continue to make this every Friday and release this video so that you can stay up to date with the news. And um, then we'll see where this goes. So subscribe and I'll see you guys later.